Pugs. Two pugs. Two pugs. Those are good. And I'll turn over to Pete to talk a little bit quickly about the sponsors. Yeah, real quick. So there's a few people that helped make this happen. Uh, one of which isn't here tonight. You'll probably see them at one of our future events. Uh, I just think about themselves in person. But it's an, a new accelerator called Start Engine, run by Howard Marks. Uh, it's formerly an activist. Uh, and also, um, we're live streaming on chill.com. Andrew's in the back. Can you raise your hand? Hello. Uh, and our longtime sponsor is savings.com. Uh, they've been our shiny from savings in the back, Joe's from savings. Uh, savings has been with us since day one. And we want to also thank Idea Lab for being a sponsor, and uh, most importantly, Koba. Let me use the space. <coughs> yeah. So, uh, how many of you haven't been to Koloff before? Um, so, for those of you who haven't been here, we're basically a shared, collaborative workspace for startups and entrepreneurs. We started Koloff. Me and my wife did basically because we needed to be around like-minded people. We were sick and tired of working from home, and we wanted to learn from others that were in the same situation as us. Uh, and that's the type of space it is. If you have questions about it, uh, come and ask me. We're right now expanding doubling our size to the next door. So we'll have a lot more space. We'll bring the sign up that capacity to the waiting list right now. But uh, in about two weeks, we'll have space to get another 100 members. So if you have questions, let me know. Thanks for coming. Also, we like really quick. I always describe this space here at Olaf as the epicenter of startups in LA. Uh, there's quite a few other great spaces, but you know, we really love what the best like Cameron have done. Cameron, please raise your hand in the back as you can. Cameron, Cam, Cam, raise your hand. Oh, that's okay, Cam. <laughs> that's the better half. That's the better half. Looks and the brain. Thank you, Cam. <laughs> so we really like them. They really like us. And so happy to be here. And turning it over to Joe. All right. Uh, I'll keep it short, but uh, my pleasure. Well, I guess there's a lot of new faces here, but uh, those of you who've been here for a while probably remember Brett Durant from IMDU gave a phenomenal presentation a couple months ago about the culture of continuous deployment at IMDU. And uh, today we're lucky enough to have uh, another IMDU alumni or alumni who's there, current, current uh, employee, uh, James Bursler, who's the VP of Engineering Management, been there about six years, and a uh, very knowledgeable guy. Sure, great presentation. Thanks, Joe. Hopefully, I'm still employed. <laughs> um, yeah, let me actually jump over here. Thanks, everybody, for coming. It's really exciting to see everybody here in the energy room. It's helpful, so it's really, uh, it's really awesome. I can't wait to hear more of the stories uh, at the end of the talk. I'll try to tear through this stuff and leave time, leave lots of time for questions at the end, and hopefully, you know, ongoing conversation starters. So, uh, yeah. So, welcome. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we how the sound <coughs> comes up the back pattern. Okay. How we uh, basically run product development at India using experiments in the scientific method. And I'll dive into all kinds of details about the things that make that possible and also specific examples of uh, some of the things that we've tried and some of the successes and some of the more entertaining failures. So if you've got questions and comments and we don't get to them here, feel free to tweet uh, them. Uh, that's my hashtag, or uh, my Twitter handle, and the Lean LA hashtag, or Lean Startup hashtag, uh, which is probably useful for many of these. So we're going to start and talk about the scientific method, which, anybody remember the scientific method from grade school? Oh, I, yeah, I have a bit of a for later, but the scientific method is, of course, based on experimentation. <laughs> And there's lots of compounding experiments going on in this example right here. Um, but the, the scientific method really is at the root of a lot of the work that we the way we approach our work at, at NU. And we use it for things like deciding which uh, user interface piece we're going to deploy to all of our customers after we, do, after we test it with uh, multiple versions to see what works best. So we do it with product feature development, but we also do it with our process so we can use it to use experiments to figure out what the optimal number of software engineers is to be on a team. It could be four, or it could be 12, or it could be somewhere in between, and you can experiment your way there. And we've seen a certain amount of success using these uh, methodologies, and therefore, you know, you too should not necessarily 
follow all of this advice. I want you to take everything I say with a grain of salt and think about your own particular context. Because everything that we've done, the successes and the failures, were that way because of our context. So take with a grain of salt. So I'm going to talk about culture, which if you don't have a culture that supports experimentation as a way to approach your product development, you're probably not going to be happy. Um, and I'll talk more about why. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the techniques and tactics that we use, specifics, and then I'm going to go into some recent examples of things that we've tried, particularly with our product development process. And I'm going to do uh, a little bit of science history here. Let's go back to Hernicus. Copernicus, think 1500s. Renaissance astronomer whose idea that the sun was at the center of the solar system and not the Earth was based on experimental observation. So he could tell by running experiments with his own two eyes. And it was an exciting discovery for him and others at the time. But interestingly, it wasn't met with uh, accolades from everyone. In fact, it was met with violence. So the Roman Catholic Church actually was literally threatened. Their whole power base was threatened by this idea that the sun and not the earth was the center of the solar system. And so they carried out the Roman Catholic Inquisition against thinkers uh, like Perkins. And he was threatened into not publishing his results until he was literally <coughs> on his deathbed, which he did. And he wasn't alone either. This is Giordano Bruno. He was uh, one of Copernicus's followers, and he met a similar fate. He was persecuted <laughs> and burned at the stake. Serious stuff. Serious stuff for, for some people that were really just trying to figure out how things worked and then report back to everyone, like, hey, I've got this great discovery about how things actually are. Galileo, uh, widely understood as the father of modern, modern science, and his, his ideas about experimentation led to what we now call the scientific method of you know, experimentation and learning. But he too was persecuted as a heretic and was held under house arrest until his death, which at least was better than Bruno, right? <laughs> so, so what's going on here? Why was it so hard for these folks to share their findings and share what they were thinking about now, the answer is complex, obviously, like really complicated. But simply, um, the folks in charge didn't support hearing the bad news. And perhaps, you know, you wouldn't either. Your whole power structure was based on, uh, you know, a falsehood. You were afraid that every, all your power was going to be taken away. However, the next real question for us here is, how is it at your company, or how will it be at the company that you're trying to start right now? Do you have it so that you can share your results, good or bad? You know, the, your pet project failed. Is it okay to go back to your product team and say, hey, I got the data back? Or is it okay to go back uh, to the whole company and with the CEO's pet project failure and you know, announce it to the whole company? You're like, yeah, it failed. If it's not safe for you, um, I'm sorry. I hope, I hope that you can work with some of the stuff that we've done uh, to help make it better. Because progress is impossible. And we have a really sweet thing that we can do because we run experiments all the time and we can share the results freely throughout the company. And it lets us learn really fast about what our customers want. And so it helps us be successful. Uh, yeah, it's good stuff. So experimentation is good. Right? You should, you know, we're going to talk. Let's talk about that. So this is the scientific method. This is the, this is the chart from 6th or 7th grade or whenever you had it. But you start with a question. You do some research. You form a hypothesis. This is really, really important. And I'll talk more about that. You run the test. You gather and analyze the data. You draw a conclusion. And you report the results. Linear learning at its finest. It's great. What have you thought of it as? continuous process of learning. And the way you were doing it was just following that methodology. And the faster you could go through the scientific method and then continue to wrap those results back into your new questions and your new hypotheses, the faster you could learn. Sounds great. How many lean startupers are there here? 
Like, I've read Lincoln's Code of Lincoln. Okay, so this should look really familiar to you. This is the lean startup build, measure, learn loop. You start with ideas and you build stuff, you build with code, you measure the data, you get learnings, and then you wrap those learnings into your new ideas and you do it all again. The faster you can go through this loop, the faster you can learn. So it's interesting to note that this is the scientific method, and it was neat to, you know, juxtapose these two charts that I was like, is it really? But like, yeah, it kind of is. So we can apply the duck test if you're, if you're not sure. It smells like a duck. It looks like a duck. It looks like a duck. And it quacks like a duck. It probably is. Okay, so that translates into something like this at India. So how are we going to run an experiment? We're going to talk to customers and get use cases from the, from the beginning. We're going to form a hypothesis to test, and then we're going to build stuff. So we're going to write some code and test it on a developer's machine. And we push it into production and test behind some flags so that only our QA people or only our admins, people in the company, can see it. And then when we're comfortable with it, we roll it out to a percentage of customers. It could be a small percentage, it could be a large percentage, depending on how fast we need the data back and also the kind of experiment that it is. And we, uh, we get the results, draw the conclusion, and then we share the learning and do it all again. And yeah, this is the scientific method in action. This is basically how we do it. You can even distill this further, which I'll do in a little bit. So we have this culture of experimentation, and it's fundamental to the success of doing the Lean Startup methodology, in my opinion. And we started this stuff in earnest a long time ago, at least six years ago. And there were only about 12 people at the company when we were really um, getting this going. We were doing test driven development and writing our first tests and building our experiment system. And so how did it all actually pan out? But back, back then, it was a small group of people. And we all sat in this tiny office space that was like way smaller than this. It was like a converted liquor store or something. It was hilarious. But we would sit around and go, you know, I think that what we need is tag clouds. Tag clouds would be awesome. And at, by lunchtime, we could have tag clouds out. And uh, basically, somebody would say, well, prove your idea is actually going to be any good. And so we'd be like, OK. So we go build it. We run an experiment, which was easy for most people to do in the company. And it was small enough that if you weren't an engineer, you could just ask somebody, just call out, and we could help. And we did it by keeping everything as simple as possible from the beginning. And so this is, this is sort of key. So this is basically what the code originally looked like, just super basically. If a customer is in the control group, we're going to do it some, some existing or old way. And if the customer is not in the control group, in other words, they're in the experiment, we're going to try out a new um, feature for them and give them the new experience. That was pretty much it. Once you start running a lot of experiments, you need to make this a little more complex. But to get started, you don't have to worry about any of the further complexity. Um, just get started simply. Once we had hundreds of experiments in play and realized how hard it was to disambiguate what was actually going on, we had to have a more robust management system. And so we built exactly what we needed. So we have a tool where we can uh, manage all of our experiments, who sees them, whether or not the thing's on or off, really quickly and really easily. Great. So they're simple to manage. And it's we also at some point realized that it's actually not trivial to figure out what's actually going on from your data. So we had to build a special tool to help us analyze the data safely and not make silly statistical or statistics based, based mistakes. Um, I have some hints on that too. Uh, so this tool's pretty cool. It, uh, Calls out statistical significance for what you're looking at. <laughs> and it will also, the green and the red indicate whether or not the thing was good or bad, a particular metric was good or bad. So this is a mixed experiment. Some things are good, some things are bad. And um, so, yeah, so what happens if you know, the, the special metric that everybody's looking at turns out to be a failure for this experiment? What happens at you is that we just go, okay, what can we learn from that? And hopefully, we had a good hypothesis to test uh, from the beginning anyway. So we, we already be learning something. But if we just embrace the failure, and we do this from the executive team on down to each of our product teams, and even in our all-company meetings, we regularly share good and bad news, and it's OK. It's really healthy. So we really practice this. It's just like this pithy quote, but it's so true for us, and it's so important to our success. It really does say a lot about uh, your culture in terms of how you respond to failure. 
this is this, this is something that uh, we're going to be talking. We at Hindu are going to be talking about more and more uh, because it turns out having a healthy culture is fundamental not just to run good experiments and running that sort of system in company, but it's just fundamental to having a happy group of people working together and the ultimate success and ultimately the great features that can be pushed out to your customers. <coughs> this is a paper I just want to share with you, written by some folks at Microsoft of all places. And it's called Practical Guide to Controlled Experiments on the Web. Listen to your customers not to be hippo, the highest paid person to be. And this holds true at Inview. In fact, um, anybody in the company's idea is just as um, interesting at the outset as anybody else's. You know, we, we look to people with ideas to have some experience and some insights around their idea. And we're not just running random spaghetti on the wall experiments just to see what happens. Although that hasn't always been true. Um, but I wanted to share this with you. The references. And so culture really is key to this. And um, I hope that there are some questions at the end uh, surrounding this, because uh, it's a pretty interesting topic. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking more about it. So, OK, so we've got this hard one freedom to experiment. Awesome. What could possibly go wrong? I mean, I've said all these great things about experimentation and touted you know, the success of India. So what could possibly go wrong is like, a lot of things can go wrong. It turns out this simple experiment system, it's like, I pulled out some funny things. The, uh, the experiment system is really simple to screw up. Like, really simple. And you can screw up at every stage. This is the, this is the interesting thing about it. Even at the beginning. So I want to talk about that a little bit. This is another synopsis of, of the whole process. It's like, start with use cases, test your hypotheses, and do it over and over and over again. And learn from that. It seems so simple. But it's possible to make a really bad mistake by asking customers what they, what they want. I'm saying, do not do that. Don't, don't ask customers what they want. Because you could get unexpected results. If you ask me what I like about my phone, and if there were any other things that I wanted to do, I'd be like, yeah. So imagine a product manager for Apple. This would never happen with Apple, but they come into me and a bunch of other people with their eye devices and they're like, well, what would you want? Like, well, gosh, based on today, I want a little sewing kit. <laughs> and I want this pointer. That'd be kind of cool. If it, yeah, that would be cool. And like a whole bunch of other things, in addition to like the things that I really use it for, which is like data management and communication. But I'm like, yeah, but I, what I want, I want everything. And they're like, oh, wow, great. Yeah, we can build that. Awesome. And it's just like, wow, if they can build that, that'd be really cool. And it turns out you probably can actually build that thing. <laughs> and you can hurt yourself using that thing. That's like scary. And it's just like not what you want. What they should have done was ask customers what they're trying to do. And, you know, develop the use cases. What are you actually trying to do with this? And they, should, they say that, I'm saying, well, basically I'm checking emails, sending text messages, and calling people on the phone. Occasionally, I'm browsing the web and doing other fanciness. But when you take away those basic communication features, I don't want this phone. And um, I can't say it enough. Focus on the use cases. Focus on what your customers are actually trying to do. Do not go and randomly ask people what they want. Because people want a lot. They'll ask for everything. So wait, here's, a, here's another example. Say you're going to try to build a rocket ship. And you want the rocket ship to go to the moon or something. So we're building a rocket to the moon. And say you make that same mistake and say, gosh, what do you want? And people might say, like, I mean, I want it to have a bar in the, in the part where the people are so that we can like drink on the way to the moon. Because that'd be cool. And it should have a really good view of everything. Because how often are you going to get to see that view? And it's like, OK, I'll try that. And so we run some experiments. And we test them out with people as much as we can with our minimum viable rocket product, right? So experiment one is like the nose cone area, because that's where people wanted the bar. It's like, well, what wins in the experiment when you're asking people? Crazy nose cone that has an expansive rounded windows and a great view of everything and a, and a big bar. And they're like, well, I think I like the idea for that, that left fin. But like that one, we wanted to have like one of these zero gravity chambers where we can all like be flying around. 
power drain. It's like, oh, okay, so we'll build that. That will not fly. Yeah, exactly. Oops. So what we want us to do, want to do is start with use cases and have a product manager in place who's kind of like vetting reality uh, with what customers are saying and going, wait a second, despite the fact that they're saying they want that, we're actually going to build something that's going to work based on our experience and our knowledge and everything we know about rockets. And we're actually going to build the thing that flies. Okay, so it's just another same, same type of example. And it's all about validating or invalidating your hypothesis. If you're going into building your product feature um, without a any hypothesis, there's really no point in running the test. You can't just do random, you can do random spaghetti on the wall tests and just see what people might like. But it's so much more effective and so much more valuable to have a hypothesis to test because then you can tell um, you know, what you learned from the results of your experiment. Did my hypothesis win or not? This is not easy, however, in some cases. Sometimes it takes a product manager with a lot of courage to be able to say, you know, despite the fact that this data is a little mushy and I can't really tell what's going on, I'm going to stick by what I think to be the correct design. And I'm really going to go for it. And at Indy, one of the things that we do is we empower product owners, we call them product managers, product owners, with like final decision making authority. And you really can, as a product owner, own the product. And you decide, like, you know what? I think this is the right way to go. And we look to people to do that. It's a lot of responsibility. And we support people with um, all the tools to make uh, good decisions. Uh, but we'd rather have that than have a bunch of wishy washy, like, oh, I don't know, let's just try, like, uh, the average. It's like, no, we don't want average. We're trying to build exceptionally good products for our customers. So Laura worked at Indie for a while, and she's awesome. She had this really awesome quote. You design a toaster oven and need to include directions for making toast, you have failed at designing a toaster oven. And it's like, yeah, you can imagine like a toaster oven, it's kind of complicated and like having to read the directions right. We would never do anything like that at Indie with our product development because we do all this experimentation. Look skeptical. Because here's an example. This is like one of the most egregious examples of screwing up experiments that we that I can talk about. <laughs> so this is our user interface of our four client products. We get, it's a 3D social gaming service. And it's an, this is an execute, downloadable, executable um, piece of software. And uh, once you have it running, you have kind of 3D stuff going on in the middle, and you have like a buddy list, and you've got all this other stuff going on. And what was actually happening here behind the scenes is that we were trying out a lot of different product feature ideas and running experiments. So everything that you see here actually won this experiment. The problem here is that there weren't a lot of strong hypotheses about what we were trying to do with these experiments. And so I can't even count the number of experiments running here. It's probably at least 100. But what I'm going to do is point out the different user interface paradigms that are here because people running the experiments also weren't really following the design guidelines. They were just like doing whatever they thought was right. And, and heck, the thing won the experiment, so why not? So here are UI paradigms that are visible here. There are at least six here. And we're just getting started, really, because there's a website portion of our product, too. And, you know, this is just a sample web page from near that time. And there are three more UI paradigms here. I mean, we're really mixing it up. But the killer one is what you just saw. It's hilarious. It's the fact that we popped this web browser right over the top of our downloadable, executable product that we spent tons of money trying to get some money and time trying to get somebody to download it for our funnel. And I'm being nice here because you can still see it in the background, but this wasn't the case. In our actual product, it, the web page completely obscured the product. That was UI, fumble number 10. And you couldn't even see it. So I was like, this is UI Fiesta. But the thing was, it was no parties for the customers because we literally lost most of the people that we had uh, worked to get to download our product. We lost them here. They never actually figured out, in most cases, like seriously, most cases, that the thing was still running in the background. They were completely lost and they were like, I don't get it. It was horrible. So in view, you know, the first lean startup, we have made a lot of mistakes. And this one in particular, like, please don't make this mistake. 
have a hypothesis that you're going to test. Don't just run a bunch of experiments without a strong point of view about what you're trying to do and learn. So when we finally did that, uh, it didn't take us very long. And we integrated all that UI into a more coherent experience. And this is pretty close to what it's like today, although we're making tons of enhancements at the moment. So, um, But it's way better. It makes a lot more sense. And our users responded. And that the graph I showed earlier has this, it has a few um, points of really uh, high percentage growth. This, along with um, implementing some new payment systems, spurred that growth. Experiment design and interpretation, in my opinion, requires professional guidance. You can make a lot of really silly mistakes if you don't have a strong statistics background. And this is an easy problem to solve. You can find PhDs in statistics, or I highly recommend PhDs in psychology, who for various reasons, are there any psychology PhDs in, in the room? <coughs> there was last time I did one of these talks. It was awesome. Because I was like, talk to that person and figure out what the heck it is. Because they're really good at designing experiments, basically, and interpreting results. So anybody with a strong statistics background and experimental design background can help you out. So do that, both for design and experimentation. Always start with use cases. Uh, and use experiments to test hypotheses, uh, not to form them. This is a huge mistake that's easy to make. And as much as I talk about these, we still sometimes make these mistakes. So it's one of these things about staying awake and staying conscious about what you're doing. We have to remind ourselves all the time to be careful. OK. I'm going to talk a little bit about some nuts and bolts of our product development process. And I've broken it up into build, measure, learn. And brief, just really briefly, we use two to three week sprints, so pretty fast. We stop at the end of every sprint, and we adjust anything that we can. So we do a, a retrospective on the sprint, and we do post portals on all the projects that we completed. And we use Agile and Extreme programming, programming methods. Does, it, does anybody, who's familiar with Agile and XP? OK, a lot of people. So when I was putting together this talk originally, I had this like, aha moment. And when you look at some of the ways that Agile and XP methods are described, it's like change, flexibility, iteration, continuous improvement. And I was like, that's like that supports experimentation like directly. And it was just a neat epiphany. And I just recently found a paper that I need to add as a reference from like I want to say eight years ago at, um, at a conference. And they were basically it was like very calmly and rationally making this case, like, yeah, Agile and XP experimentation is awesome. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Uh, this is one of the very early scrum boards that we used, and it's funny to look at because we used we used string because we were so cheap that we didn't want to like draw on the board, which is hilarious because there were push pins in core board and the pins fell out all the time. It was crazy. We wasted a ton of time doing this. But anyway, this is one of the first boards that we did. And Scrum is a project management methodology. Anybody use Scrum? Yeah. Pretty standard. It's it's the it's the not waterfall. So <coughs> how does it work? Me, one of this was uh, many self-organizing teams, very short sprints, daily stand-up meetings, not more than 15 minutes long, um, just short circuit all the communication failures that could happen in a day, using email and uh, everything else, just meet together, get on the same page, and proceed. It works great. Having very clear roles and responsibilities, too, is really crucial. So we <coughs> say, you know, product owner, you have responsibility for deciding ultimately what this team is going to ship or not. And then on the technical side, we have a tech lead who's a software engineer, and we say, we can't ship any of this stuff if it's going to not if it's not going to scale or if there's some technical failure that's going to happen as a result of this. And so you get a lot of good uh, dialogue and uh, strongly worded dialogue between tech leads and product owners as they argue about how to build stuff and what to build. But it's great. And then you know, visual designers, user experience designers, QA. All of these roles have special responsibilities, and it's great um, when something fails. It's really easy to tell like what went wrong. And it's not about uh, placing blame. It's just figuring out like, how can you improve the process that each of these people is using. And overall, 
we always stay flexible and we're not dogmatic about anything that we do because something that we're using today as a process might not actually work next week and it probably won't work in six months for sure. So we're constantly reevaluating uh, what we're doing and how successful it is for us. And I've said that a couple of times now, but we actually do that. We stop after every sprint and we do a retrospective and there are action items and we follow up on them every time. It's a constant process of learning. And so we measure stuff. Um, over time, we've tried all kinds of different metrics that we uh, thought were important for like, how to measure our productivity and for really how we measure value delivered to customers. And so we tracked, like, hey, how many projects or stories did we complete? Did we spend a lot of time on tasks and which ones? Um, we use story points. Anybody try using story points here? Okay. So it's just Unplanned versus planned work. Like, how much extra stuff did we take into the sprint that we didn't mean to? And also, this one's really interesting. How productive and happy do we feel? We started tracking this um, after a team just decided to run this experiment themselves. And I'll talk a little bit more about that experiment. But all these things can be used to measure how much value you are actually delivering to customers. And the learning part. How do we how do we learn from all this stuff? We use a bunch of different, uh, a bunch of different ways. We do postmortems and retrospectives. We do five whys root cause analysis. Who knows what five whys is? How many people have actually done a five whys root cause analysis? Okay. And then, in general, we support open communication. This one's special because it's um, it's something that you can do all the time. There could be a question in the back. Yeah, actually I do, if you don't mind. Go for it. Um, can you back the last slide for a second? So, uh, no, one more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one. So, to me that kind of seems like all those things are measuring stuff that you've made, but not necessarily value that you've necessarily delivered. So we have other metrics that we, that we look at that are core to our business. So we track revenue and retention. So those are key indicators that, you know, that we look at when we're thinking about like, how is our business doing overall, but for how is our process running and how are our teams doing, we could use those final metrics, but these are kind of like intermediate surrogate metrics that if all these things look good, we're probably also delivering lots of value to customers that we can measure in other standard metrics like revenue and retention. Great question. Okay. So I just want to talk really quickly about some of the ways that we do support open communication. Um, we actually talk about it. We talk to ourselves about how much we value good communication. And we train ourselves on how to be good communicators, like basic conflict resolution and how to like really hear what somebody else is saying. Stuff that you can use in the real world. It's really cool. Um, but we also do stuff like we have a special role called engineering project manager whose job it is partially to just make sure people are communicating effectively. And there's one of those for every team. Uh, we do matrix management where basically our managers manage people across lots of teams. And so these managers get a slice of what's going on across the company every week because <coughs> we do weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings with all of our uh, team members. Uh, we do a scrum of scrums, so all the scrum teams get together once a week for a very short like Uber meeting to, to trade information and uh, make sure that dependencies are um, thought about. We swap people among teams pretty liberally as uh, people want to switch teams. And we have an open floor plan, so some of these things are like really basic, and some of them um, are more you know, subtle and but important. Okay, quickly on um, postmortems and retrospectives, how to do them. Has anybody here done a postmortem or retrospective for a project or a sprint? Yeah, okay, same people. Great. So I'm going to talk about um, just a meeting role, some of the metrics that we talk about sometimes in our postmortems for projects. Um, the importance of action items, and then also just the importance of doing this at all levels of the organization. We really do this. We do them for our project teams. We do them for the engineering team as a whole, or the product team can do them. We do them with our just our officer group. We'll do postmortems if things go wrong at a strategic level. Um, it's, it's a healthy process to do. So what's it look like? Skill facilitator. This is like the important role before one of these meetings because if things did not go well, people will come to the meeting and they will not want to talk about it. Always. Sometimes a little bit. 
sometimes there's this uncomfortable silence. It's like, what are we going to do about this? Who's going to be the first person to say, like, the thing went really bad? And in some cases, it could be really bad. Let's say, a, like, a, like, a VP forced a project to be done without going through, like, a regular process or whatever, and the team's just, like, pissed. Well, you need somebody that can kind of sense what's going on. And really, we know what's going on when we convene these meetings. If, like, our good, good project managers know. And so they have to be able to foster good communication and do it in a safe way and really be able to talk about that thing that nobody wants to talk about, the elephant in the room, right? So we put time into, we're careful about who we let lead these meetings. Some of the things that we've talked about in the past have included things like how many days did we work on a project or how many story points did we, did we, uh, did we get done? Uh, what were the projects themselves? And like, what happened in that sprint? Like, did we trade somebody away? And like, what happened? So this is some of the data that we capture so later on when we're looking at the year or you know the sprint two year two years ago. We want to see what happened there. We'll remember. And you know, at some level it's important to keep track of this stuff. Well it worked for us for most of our uh, most of the last three years. We're actually not keeping track of stuff like this anymore. And I'll talk about that more in a sec. So this is a this is a whiteboard from one of our uh, it's probably a project post morning. And so we have four columns. We keep track of like, hey, what's the status of this project? It's done, but was it successful? What were the metrics? Did, did it succeed or fail based on our hypothesis? And then what are the things that went well that we want to keep doing? What are the things that did not go well that we want to stop doing? And then what are the new things that we want to try based on our experience in this project? And this is just totally standard. We've been using this uh, format for years. And it works pretty well. We're very careful about capturing action items and actually completing the action items. If you don't actually complete the action items, your teams will not trust you, and they'll just uh, think these meetings are a complete waste of time. But these are among the most valuable meetings that we have. Uh, five whys. A bunch of people ran five whys, but you said essentially start with your problem. We usually start with a timeline and go, okay, what happened? Something went wrong. Let's get as much, as much data as we can about what actually happened. And then we start asking questions. It's like, well, in this case, logins were failing, and Know, some technical things seem to be wrong. But in many cases, it's not a techno technological problem. Um, sometimes it's a human problem. So in this, in this example, which I won't read through, um, you can just skip down to the question five. Why didn't James know about catching slow queries? And well, he was new, and we didn't cover that in our training. And so at that point, there's our root cause. We will fix that root cause and amend our training materials. Um, yeah. Always fix your root causes. Do your action items. Assign names to those action items and make people do them. Um, so always fix your root causes and always take the size of the fix commensurate with the size of the problem. So if you took out the website and it was out for 10 seconds and customer impact was minimal, maybe you don't need to spend a month fixing whatever system failed. Maybe you spent 10 minutes making it a little bit better. But if you did take out the website and your product was down for a month, causing you to lose millions of dollars, and probably had some significant work to do, and it's justified, right? The big impact. Okay, those are some of the processes that we used to learn. Here are some recent process experiments. I just want to remind everybody, don't be dogmatic about how you do things, and don't be dogmatic about listening to me. All this stuff worked in a particular context. Doesn't, many of these things don't work for us now, and they might not work for you either, but it is interesting food for thought. So, not that long ago, had about three big development teams, and one of them, and we'll, across all the teams, we spread the pain of our BuildBot server. So every time somebody commits code, which happens 50 to 100 times a day, it has to go through a battery of automated tests to see if they broke anything with their code. And any time a test breaks, somebody has to fix the test. They have to figure out what broke, and then they have to fix it. And every time that happens, it slows down all the rest of the tests running. And so in the course of a day, each team would have broken six or seven build machines. And so say you've got 20 build machines out, if we had 40 total, our process just slowed down by half. It's terrible. And we were trying to split up all this work of keeping it running among all the teams. But recently, we decided, well, that was the old way. Basically, everybody, everybody's in pain. And all the schedules for all those teams and what they actually were planning to work on are all at risk. But we did that for years. Recently, though, we decided, okay, let's try to create an interrupt team. 
And the first question was like, what the heck is going to want to work on the interrupts team? And it turned out we had lots of other more interesting work than just handling the interrupts for this team. And lots of people volunteered for it. And so we did that. We got uh, almost a full team. And then to fill the other slots on the team, we created, we just said, look, you other people that don't want to participate on this team right now, you'll have a home team. It's the team that you're on most of the time. But every nine weeks or so, you're going to rotate into the interrupts team, and you're going to help fix stuff that's going wrong. And we just thought we'd try that out and see if it worked. And nobody believed it would work at all. But what happened was that this team found, they basically, they needed to innovate because there were only like four of them and they had, they were doing the work that many more people had been doing previously. And necessity being the mother of invention, they figured out new ways to handle all this work. It was, it was really brilliant. And even the, um, our effort to you know, make sure that the team had enough people on it by rotating people in turned out to be incredibly valuable because the people that are rotating in bring in new skills and they look at uh, what that team's doing, and they're like, you guys are crazy for doing it this way. And they see things that the team members don't actually see because they're there all the time. It's, it's, it's a great system. So there you go, handling interrupts. This experiment was one about time tracking. We used to care a lot about figuring out if we could do good time estimation for our engineering tasks. And surprisingly, we got pretty darn good at it, but it took a lot of effort. And um, in many ways, it was a waste of time. So we had a team that said, you know what, we're just not going to track time anymore. We're not, gonna, we're not going to put estimates on tasks. All we're going to do is make sure that we're working on the right stuff. And we're going to work on it until the feature or whatever it is is awesome. And that's what they did. So they were just focusing on the features, the value of the customers, and not how long it was taking. That made everybody really happy. Not only because they had short planning needs, but because they were focused on like, just delivering value to customers and doing it by building great products. So overall, this was a winning experiment. And I'm going to talk in a minute about how we translated this to all of, the, all of our teams. But there is a problem with this. It's harder to predict your progress when you haven't done any estimates at all. And some teams can't handle that. So the way we handle that now is that sometimes somebody wants to know, like, when is this project going to be done? And at that point, it's a great time to get the most accurate estimate possible because you've already done a bunch of work leading up to that. So we give them a just-in-time estimate. We don't spend a lot of time on it. Just tell them it's a ballpark. But um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a requirement for that Good question. So you weren't tracking velocity at all in terms of like Scrum? Nope. Nope. Their chart was blank. How long until you got there? To that, that took us, we had to build up a lot of trust on our teams to be able to get to that point. It took a good two, two and a half years of kind of going through all these different kind of scrum processes. And I'm, I'm really compressing time here. Some of these examples we've been doing for years and years, and some of them we've just started. So it's a really good question. Part of the learning that you do as a team, as a company, lets you try new experiments that you could never try successfully earlier on. So this, this required a lot of trust. Yep? How do you know when you're done? So in the last example, how do you know when you're done? Well, the product owner ought to have a really strong idea about what done means. For us, it means you're done when you build a product that you're proud of, and that you think is awesome, the team thinks is awesome, and that your customers tell you is awesome. So if you're building a game, and what you want to do is you want to put that game in front of a customer and you want to say, hey, play this game. You want to watch their reaction. Just tell them you're going to pay them 50 bucks for 30 minutes. After 15 minutes, if they're smiling and everything or whatever they're doing, you can say, look, you can take 50 bucks now. We're done. Or you can keep playing. If they stay and keep playing, you probably have, <laughs> you probably have a winning product feature right there. So some variant in that. So we're really focused. It's kind of subjective. And we have a high bar. What about scope creep? What about scope creep? Let's hold that question until the end. That's a good question. This, this is a, these are good classic questions. I might I talk about scope creep. Well, OK, so basically you need a strong, courageous product owner to keep scope creep from happening. That's, that's the nutshell version, in my opinion. OK. Scrub 2.0 turned into, um, based on our, that process experiment, we stopped tracking time, and we also stopped caring about the sprint. We used to have sprint deadlines where we could really try to push ourselves to finish something by a certain deadline. And with this new team, they were like, well, we just want to keep going until it's really awesome, until it's done. 
And so what they started doing was say, look, we'll stop every three weeks to do a retrospective regardless, but things don't have to be done. We're just checking in to see how we're doing. So it's continuous planning based on that successful process experiment. And it's kind of like it's just in time planning when we do planning. So the retrospective could happen after three weeks and we go, well, do we still have work that's ready to go? Do we need to do any planning? And the answer could be no. It's like, no, let's get back to work. And then when they run out of stuff, and they're like, hey, you know, we're going to need to plan a little bit. So we need to do tech design for something. They'll just stop whatever they need to and, and do that big plan. And then they just, we just continually ask, are we working on the right stuff for customers? Like, that's an important metric for us now. And is the thing something I'm proud of at this point? Is it ready to release yet? Those are really important questions for us, way more important than how long will it take us to build that? It's like, we're just going to do it right. <coughs> this is the basic one, keeping your team together. Just uh, So we have a bunch of product development teams. They're all working in different areas. And we just physically locate them in the same parts of the building. And it solves all kinds of crazy bad communication problems that you get when your team you know, basically gets more than about four people. And we do have more than four people on our teams now. So we put everybody together. And it means that groups that used to sit together all the time, like our data insights team, they're uncomfortable a little bit because now they're sitting with software engineers, designers, and everybody else. Same goes with design and, um, and everything. So basic, but effective. Have a fixer. This is that engineering project manager role that I mentioned earlier. Part of that role is to just make sure that everything is going as smoothly as possible, that our teams are happy, productive, and delivering value to customers as quickly as possible. Like That is a key part of my job when I'm acting <coughs> the role of an engineering project manager. I have tremendous latitude to make sure that teams have equipment they need, um, that they're getting any kind of support that they need, and um, it can really be anything. We're not about providing a team anything they ask for as long as it results in better value to customers. So we remove any kind of blocks. Sorry, this is really hard to read. Uh, this person's, part of this person's job is to remain objective. So as an engineering project manager, I'm on the team, but I'm not like in the nitty gritty of the team. I don't have a clipboard and I'm not tracking tasks. What I'm trying to do is make sure that the team's not driving itself into a wall and not realizing it. So that causes, that requires you to re uh, retain some level of objectivity. And I'm really shooting for team happiness. Because it turns out, a happy team is a very productive team. And I would much rather spend my time making sure someone's happy than be tracking them down to find out if they were productive enough. So we just find if somebody's happy, they're going to be productive. And that's what we focus on, is the happiness. Which is a fun way to approach work. OK, technical project reviews uh, came out of um, our, one of our technical directors, who was responsible for failures at a high level. And they said, you know what? I'm not getting enough insight because of all the projects that are getting done. So every time we ship something, we're going to get the engineers together for a very short meeting and do a, basically a group code review and see if we need to change anything about that. And so this engineering-led team can take work back to the product-led team, and the work gets done. So I don't know if that happens at people's companies here, but we have a really good relationship between engineering and product, and we trust each other. So if the engineers are saying, we have to fix this thing, because if we don't, we're going to be kind of screwed later when our usage doubles. Product listens, and we um, get that stuff done. This was a pretty interesting experiment. We just took a team, and we moved them out of the main building, and we rented them a garage. And uh, <laughs> got them like basic startup stuff, like power and water and caffeine and little fridge. And even a, there was a patio umbrella in the back. It was hilarious. And it was a tremendously successful experiment. We, and we said, oh, we also said, do not follow any of our current process. <laughs> if you do, we will, you know, you're in trouble or whatever. And so um, they basically recreated their own, they started from scratch with everything. And it was brilliant. So we broke the routine completely for these guys. Minimized our process. In fact, we very strongly to leave it all behind. And really just focused on value to customers. And so they were working on top secret stuff. Rest assured, it was an incredibly accessible, successful experiment. And one of the takeaways is to just randomly shake things up for teams. I have an example. Uh, uh, did you validate that by randomly shaking it up a number of times? <laughs> we or had enough success. Or, or you could have just learned that all your processes suck. 
Um, <laughs> here's the thing. That's a good question. So did we just learn that all our processes sucked? Or like, what, what happened there? Well, so they had a very particular context. They had the context of a small startup company working out of a, a small garage space. And a lot of our process, there actually isn't that much of it, but a lot of it is designed to combat the problems that you get when your team gets so big that it's just hard to communicate effectively. And so a lot of what we do is just, so at, a large, at the scale that we run there with the rest of our teams, it's appropriate to have a lot of this process, but not all of it. You know, we did have learnings that were like, why do we do that kind of meeting? That that's, that's just a waste of time. And we're like, yeah, we hadn't even thought of it because we've been doing it for so long. So that's one of the benefits that you get by shaking things up. You know, people get out of the building for a couple of months, they come back and go, you guys are all totally crazy. And we're like, we're not crazy. And they're like, sit down, yes you are. And they like lock the door. We have, we have the top, right? So um, let me just, I'm almost done here, and then we'll go to, go to questions, which I think are like, really interesting. We let people self-select onto teams. And we just find that happy people are just more productive and happy, kind of, you know, engaged. They're, they care a lot more about what they're delivering to customers. And work is just a lot more fun for everybody. So surprisingly, when you get to the size of teams that we have more we're over 120 people in our company now, and we're about half engineering. Um, uh, people self-select to cover all of your needs, or most of them. So there's very little management overhead to making this work, which was awesome. This was the shake things up example. Um, so we did it in the biggest way possible by moving a team out of the building. Oh man, sorry. This looks way better on my screen than this. Um, but that switch to continuous planning or Kanban that I talked about was predicated on a big company-wide um, kind of reset that we did. And spontaneously, I didn't, nobody had to say like, hey, we should all switch to continuous planning and use Kanban and dump this process we've been using for years. All the teams themselves just decided to do it just as part of the, the whole reset that we did. An example that I wanted to bring up is that sometimes on teams, a while ago, I used to just change them from using ideal days to story points, like every few months. The story points as a concept is sort of hard to like, get your head around and believe in. And um, ideal days is a little easier for, for some people, but it's like it's split 50 50. Anyway, I would just split and say, you know what? We're starting to use ideal days now. You guys have been using story points for a while. And people would just like, the meeting would just wake up and be like, what? What is an ideal day? And, like, tell me this again. When that engagement, is really what you want by these um, small tweaks in process that don't have to be like as large scale as that mini startup that we did, but um, it really does re-engage people and foster conversation, which is just which is what you want. You want the communication. Okay. This is it. This is the recap. So strong proponent of scientific method, obviously. We can start at methodologies. Culture is really key to this, and so is learning. So that's that's my talk. Um, I look forward to your questions. So let's do it. We've got, we've got some time on. Yeah, so we're there. Um, what, is, what is your training look like? I mean, ideally, you people walk in with the right uh, you know, background and personality and specific culture, but what do you guys have to train them and get them to the right? Yeah, so what does our training look like? So when we have new employees come on board, they're always, by the time they come into the building, they have an email in their um, non-employee inbox that explains, and they probably talk to their manager, that explains exactly how their first day is going to go. They already know the team they're going to be on. They know um, who their mentor is. Everybody gets a, a mentor of some kind. So they, they arrive at the company, and they're met by their manager, and this person has been assigned to help them acclimate to how we do work. And then different teams have different spin-up processes in engineering. We call it engineering boot camp. And for a period of about, um, it can be up to nine weeks, is that right? Well, let's call it six to eight weeks, I'd say, when people are spun up. They go through a, a battery of things that we know every software engineer needs to do, all being shepherded by somebody who's been around for a while and knows the ropes. And it's that person's, it's that mentor's responsibility to make sure that person is successful. Like their success is literally tied, while they're mentoring somebody, to that person's success. So and we have a, a good long talk about that anytime we're going to assign a mentor to somebody. So that we take it really seriously. It's one of the most important, uh, bigger processes that we do. And it's interesting. It's totally people-focused, and it's 
focused on helping people to be happy and successful. We put a lot of energy into it. Good question. Um, what are your, your projects like? Is it, is it like 10 features within a project, or do you in charge of, because you do continuous deployment? So do you, do you try to create the smallest project possible? Yeah, so the question is, what do the, what do the projects look like? Are they big projects? Are they small projects? Do we cut them into pieces? Like, how do we manage with continuous deployment for all those features? So the way it works is that we typically, projects can be any size. Projects can be really big, or they can be really small. But on a big project, what you do is you have to start somewhere. And so we figure out where to start, basically. We break it down into, like, at the biggest level, let's just imagine that could be a 10 sprint project. So that, that'd be a huge project for us. We don't really do them that big, but occasionally we do. And then we say, okay, what's got to happen first? Well, there's a lot of design that's got to happen. Anyway, you can basically plan and break down the project into pieces. And once you can figure out what's got to happen in the first couple of sprints, you're at a good spot to kind of get going. And you want to have some kind of design written down. We're at a stage now where we are demanding more stuff to be written down than we ever have in the past. Because as an agile shop, we try to not have written artifacts because it's just slow. So, um, but it kind of depends on the phase that you're at. If your projects are medium to small. You can just sit in a room with the, with the team, talk about it for an hour, and that's your spec, and you have the plan, and you should just go, don't write anything down. So we at the point we're at now, though, we write stuff down, and we make sure that there's a product. We call it a project brief, but it's basically a mini PRD or an MRD. So PRD, and then we do a technical design document that is like how technically we're going to create all those features. And then from that technical design document, engineering can go away and do its work. Before that's all happened, design has been meeting with the product to figure out what it is we're building, the customer facing feature, what it's going to look like, we do all kinds of user research and um, user experience design. So by the time it actually gets to a point where we're going to build it, it's been really well designed and tested. So, great question. I'm here. Just to segue into that, could you talk a little bit about the degree to which the people on your teams are specialists and the degree to which they're generalists? Great question. So are people specialists or generalists? Over time, it's changed from more general generalist to more and more specialist. So as a small startup company, everybody that was there had to basically be able to do the same thing, which is a great strategy because you never know what's going to come up. But as we um, Gotten bigger, and you start saying, you know, I'm spending a lot of time writing backend code and working with the database, and maybe it's time that we get somebody that actually loves thinking about databases and optimizing queries. And if I just took the server down and customers weren't happy, and so you, you find reasons to specialize, and these things can actually come out of your performance or retrospectives when it's like writing on the wall, I'm horrible at CSS and JavaScript. We have to hire specialists now. So, more and more. So, um, but over, I guess over the course of time, we had a smattering of like different specialties, like user experience designers would be in, but they weren't core to the process because you need them for a bit. Um, front end specialists sometimes, maybe. Um, but now we're big enough that we need all these specialties. So that's a great question. And then there was one in the back. I can't remember who had it. Yeah. Um, you guys use PRDs, and then you also do the text back. Is there anything in between those? Or do you guys do story sessions to get the PRD text back? Or do you do story, story sessions before the PRD? So the question is, you guys, we use PRDs and technical specs. Is there any in between steps or other design phases? Or how do you get from PRD to the text spec and back? And is there other story pointing phases and things like that? Is that yeah, about the yeah. right question? So yeah, we use the minimal required process in writing things down to get the job done. And sometimes it depends on the project. We've done longer design documents and longer technical designs and really long planning meetings to try to spec things out. So we had, we used to do it where we do like a six hour planning meeting and at the end of the meeting we would have three weeks worth of work for a whole bunch of people spec down to day or less post-it notes. And we were actually pretty accurate. It just took forever. But most of the time we don't need that level of um, granularity on how long something's going to take because we're as good as we were, we're still wrong. We're still like at least 50% wrong, which is pretty good. So I don't think there's a good final solution to the estimation problem. But anyway, as little as possible, but lots of face-to-face -face communication goes on between product and engineering to figure out what we ought to be building. And then it doesn't just happen one day in a meeting. It happens every single day because of our scrum 
and while people are working, we encourage people to walk around and see what's happening. And um, engineers are routinely you know, interrupting product owners or vice versa to find out what's going on. Same thing with design. That's why we see everybody's seated around each other. We can keep track easily of, of what's going on. It's, it's, it's like a mini environment that we had when we were 12 people in the you know, converted liquor store. So, so the product people scrum and engineers. Yeah. Say so maybe this is really obvious, but product people are also part of the engineering scrum. Oh yeah, it's like yeah, the scrum the scrum is everybody that is relevant to what the team's working on right now. So sometimes people are there and sometimes they're not always there. But the core team, engineering, product, design, QA, data insights, they're all there. Yeah, great question. Here and there. Um, Especially in the startup kids, did you ever use the remote developers and how did you do the face to face interaction if the person wasn't? Local? Good question. We early on didn't do anything remote. We were, we were in downtown Palo Alto, so it was not hard for us to find um, people that we, and we wanted to work just for communication ease, pretty much with just people in our office. Now we have um, a couple of remote developers, and we handle it now using WebEx. We've tried lots of different things, and if WebEx stops working for us, we'll stop using it. But basically, we have cameras in all of our conference rooms with big TV screens, and we broadcast the like the scene in the room to the people that are remote, and we share the desktop of the presenter machine, so you can see exactly what's going on, and it's, it's actually pretty good. We've also we used Skype, and we used um, web-based scrum boards to just kind of keep track of what's going on so anybody can access it from anywhere. So it's not so bad with uh, the technology at hand. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So um, I know Eric was saying that in the beginning you guys had some stumbling blocks in terms of product features, and, and but so I'm kind of curious, like, how long did it take when you, you were just a handful of guys in a room um, to get to that point where, like, you're really cranking it? And I guess, like, I guess velocity was normalized, and you were really pushing out uh, features. And then, second part of the question is, as as you were just working on engineering the product, um, what were like the top maybe three metrics that you um, really measured as the most important metrics that you feel like led to like hyper growth, that led to like exponential? Um, uh, okay. So let me answer the, the first part, or the second part first. So we went through different phases of thinking different metrics were most important. And I'm trying to think about, I have to be kind of careful about what I say about what metrics I think are important for running our business. So let me just give you some metrics that we have looked at in the past. And we look at things like um, long-term retention, very short-term retention, Acquisition, like rates through a funnel, like a conversion funnel. And one of the most important ones, it's sort of like the Uber metric, is this revenue. Because it's so easy to see, like, are you providing value to customers or not? Well, are they paying us money? Yes. Yes, we are. We're doing something right. So let's dig into that more. So I'm trying to think if there are any other, like, super duper important ones. There probably are. But for running business, those are sort of, and probably the same metrics that you all use for running your businesses, too. There are lots of internal metrics that we use that to tell how successful we think we are going to be like when certain product features are released. And those are some of the things I was mentioning before. Like We can tell if there's a buzz in the building and if people are proud of their features and we know how the user testing is going and people are talking about it, we can tell. Um, now, in terms of the other question that you asked, which um, had to do with how long was it before our team were really clicking and we were really productive? Once we were really productive from the very start, it just happened that it was 12 people working 14 hour days and we were super productive. And then as we got bigger and bigger, we needed to scale our systems to work for multiple teams and way more engineers and things like that. And getting that system to be fluid and um, always work is an ongoing process. So it was probably about a year ago that we had to like basically stop our production line completely and just fix our build machines because there was there was just there were so many broken tests, nobody could commit code, and we were just dead in the water. So we just said, okay, we're just gonna stop. Everybody stop your project work. We're actually working on engineering infrastructure because we had to. So it actually a built-in feedback loop. We train our engineering team to always do whatever they think the right thing is. And so if they think the right thing is to just fix infrastructure, they'll just peel off and pick, fix infrastructure. They will tell products what they are doing, however. They'll just do it in isolation. But um, anyway, great question. It's one 
here and then we'll go back there. Let's say, just assume it's like a, you're in like a larger organization of like a hundred or more people and you don't have that sort of culture of experimentation. Where do you start? Does that have to come from the top? Can it come from the middle, the bottom? Okay, so I think it has to come from everywhere. And if you're missing, but it's, it kind of depends on your, your existing company culture. We implemented Scrum as a, as a formalized <coughs> process about three and a half years ago. And we've been using it kind of, but not really, and different people were doing it different ways. And we just, just for efficiency, wanted to formalize on it. The way we did it was we hired a head of product who came to us from Yahoo, who was already using Scrum, and was like, yeah, I made it to win with Scrum. And our engineering leaders were like, yeah, we're gonna do it too. And then since so many people in the company had already been using bits and pieces of Scrum, it was a completely painless process for us to switch over completely, basically overnight, to start using it. We had support at all levels. It just sort of depends on your company. We really need support from the top. We need support that it's a hundred percent or more company. You probably have like directors and managers and people like that. They all need to be on board. And I think you just need a critical mass. You know, I don't know what the percentage would be, but you know, more than fifty percent of the people have to be <coughs> on board to do it. And I think you need support at all levels. It's probably just going to be harder. I don't think anything's impossible though. I think good ideas are always going out. Or at least they should. Anyway, um, so back in the back, and then back in the front, and then so back again. Um, so since you don't, uh, you were saying you don't actually follow, or you said don't listen to what customers want, or don't ask customers what they want in the product in terms of product features. Yeah. How do you then map out your product roadmap um, in, in terms of features? Do you do behavior analytics, or like how do you actually influence, or, or what's the biggest influence for figuring out the next features that you're going to roll out for your product? Yeah, so for not asking our customers what they want, how do we actually figure out our product roadmap and what customers want next? Well, that's a great question, and it's one that we have to remind ourselves, like, we ask them the right questions. So we always, we always ask about what are you trying to do with the product? So that's, that's the question that we start with usually. But we're also in conversation with customers a lot on different levels. So we have forums, and we have a community manager, and we have product managers who keep in touch with customers. Um, and we also uh, bring people in for usability research. And product managers also just have an idea based on their experience and their instinct about what a good product would be in the sort of area that we're trying to build. <coughs> so like generally speaking, at a high level strategically, we know kind of the areas that we're, that we're targeting. And we expect our product managers to have a point of view about what's going to be awesome in that area and what we should build. And then we grill them like crazy and make sure that they know what the heck we're talking about and, that's, and that we're going to be right. And part of that process is like, did you talk to customers? And right. what kind of, which customers did you tell you? really doing a good job of vetting that. Yeah. But it's, the, it's not that we don't talk to customers. And I'm sure that occasionally we do kind of probably in some way ask them just like what they want. Right. But really we're focused on meeting use cases mm -hmm. and providing value that we know customers do you, do you validate that with like qualitative testing or like focus groups or anything? Or? We don't use, so how do we validate that? Do we use focus groups or other kind of testing? We don't use focus groups usually. We usually, we do lots of um, bring one person in and you know, we videotape the, the customer experience and then we talk about it and bring in lots and lots and lots. Um, okay. We haven't used focus groups though. I talked about the technical details about the experiment system that we're using now as it's gotten more complicated. Not at any detailed level, but I can tell you some of the things that we had to solve for. So initially when we had no experiment, experiments running, it was a simple matter to just have an experiment by using code just like that. But once you have a bunch of experiments going, you have problems figuring out like, well, gosh, if customer A got into experiment one and also experiment three and seven, now, what does that mean? And like, so you need more sophisticated ways of managing which customers make it in which experiments. And then you also need special experiments just to like handle one-off things. Like we just need to, we just need everybody in this or this. And like once you get really complicated, it's not, we call it a singleton. And so what else, what other problems that we had to solve? Um, just 
just <coughs> managing large numbers of sheer numbers of experiments was crazy, and um, trying to manage it for ourselves as software engineers so that it's just easier to tell what's happening in the code. So when a product manager says, "Hey, we need an experiment to do X, Y, Z," and you're like, and you're in the code, you're going, "Wow, there are like 70 forks right here. Which one do we want?" So we had to basically made it easier for us to tell what's going on. So without going into any technical detail, because honestly, I haven't looked at that code in at least two years. <laughs> so, that's a great question. Yeah, if I go to Trader Joe's a lot, I remember one time they got rid of this Gorgonzola spread that I really liked. And it turns out, you know, Trader Joe's is very much the kind of consumer food counterpart they do. Rid of shit, rid of new stuff in there. Um, do you ever have this? Do you ever communicate to your customers that you're experimenting on them, or do you ever have a backlash of people saying, "Holy shit, what happened to that?" That was yesterday. Yeah. So when we're doing all this, these product changes, do we communicate with people and warn them? Do we, or is there an any backlash? People know what we're doing. Sometimes people know what we're doing, and sometimes people don't. So if we're going to take out a feature that we know is in use by customers and we want it to be better, for example, and we, we're not happy with it. You know they've like crawled over broken glass to figure out how to use this feature that we didn't implement very well and they want it, but there's only like 5,000 of them or 20,000 of them. We'll explain to them carefully that look, this isn't this doesn't meet our standard of quality. We're actually ripping this feature out. We're gonna you'll see it again at a future time, and then it's gonna be implemented in this way that you're gonna love it. Other times we just don't tell people. So it's the same way when you go to the Google homepage. Might be seeing the different Google homepage than me. They probably have just dozens of experiments running at any time. But it's a mix of both. We're, we try to be pretty careful about um, being cognizant that we do have a community of users and we want them to know that we're trying to take care of them and build the best product that we can. But it's hard because it's sometimes it actually causes a real pain for people to, to, to miss out on some product feature that they really use. In case we respond and we fix, we realize like, hey, we missed a use case there. We forgot about that. And we'll go back and we'll fix that thing. But the outcry is really strong. So we've got a couple more minutes left. Um, more in the back and up here. When you talk about releasing 50 100 times a day, are you equating each release or each item with an actual experiment? No. So when we release 50 or 100 times a day, is there an experiment with each release? No, there's not. When, we're, when we do our, our website releases, Somebody can be writing a piece of code on a feature that's not done yet, and they just check it in, and it gets pushed out into production in 20 minutes. And that's a release. It's just incomplete code, and it's probably hiding behind a rollout variable, so it's never actually exercised in production <laughs> until it's turned on. So we have only put experiments in place when, uh, well, we run experiments lots of times, and they could just be inactive, asleep in the code until the feature's completely done, and we turn it on. So it's not an experiment with every, with every code in the yeah. Uh, my question is about the testing tool that you built. I, mean, I, I find that one of the most difficult challenges is getting a group to a community when you can take the time to go to the testing platform. Um, and then, even if you agree on that, determining what the testing platform should be able to do or not do, and what the data is in fact, is very, very difficult because people want to keep moving forward and building the testing platform that you feel like really important. So you talked about the importance of that a couple of times. How, you know, how much pain did you actually have to suffer before you decided to do it? And then how long did you spend building it? How painful was it or how much work did it take to convince ourselves that we had to, we should build experiment management tools and data reporting tools for ourselves? And did it take a long time and was it hard? We um, since we were already all of us bought off on the idea of running experiments, it was really when it became Harder to manage them and deal with them. Like we had it easy, relatively speaking. If you're in, if you're in a place where people don't get the value of actually tracking what you're doing with data and trying to use that data effectively, because if people don't buy that approach, then that's one of those cultural elements that it's going to be probably more difficult to overcome. Not impossible because um, that funnel tool, the one with all the cool stats going on, was built as a side project by one of our engineers originally. <coughs> they were like, I'm tired of just trying to figure this out because product owners were asking them, like, hey, we need to pull some data, we need to like help run this analysis. And 
it's like I forget it. So there's that part of our engineering culture as well that liberates people to like just do the right thing and do what they think is going to have the most value. Because yeah, the people on the team on like doing stuff have the best idea about how to how to have those values. So there's this and that. Okay, um, way in the back. Um, could you talk a little bit briefly about um, how you organize the teams? In other words, how do you know how do you assign what team is going to work on? Um, so you've got 50 or 60 engineers broken down into I don't know how many different scrums, and are they focused on a particular uh, customer segment or a particular metric or an initiative, or and how does that how does that change from? Um, it doesn't change much month to month. We try to keep our teams pretty solid. The way it breaks down is that we have an engineering infrastructure team that's really focused on our build systems and really anything that engineers need to be productive, technology-wise. That team just is always pretty much there. Operations runs our 800 plus machine cluster. Um, and that's just a kind of a standard old school operations group um, with, with mad DevOps skills. They're awesome. Um, those guys are always there. And then we have our interrupts team, which is handling interrupts plus a, a bunch of other um, interesting work <coughs> that I can't talk about um, because it's secret. Um, they're pretty much there, and then our product teams that execute on our, our wider product strategy, it's really broken down by like chunk of product strategy as it makes sense. And um, so we've got, say if we have three big chunks of product strategy, we'll have three teams, and then those teams get allocated resources based on what percentage of resources in the company do we think ought to be focused on each of those initiatives. And then that can mean like 18 engineers, four engineers, 12 engineers, and then from there, we, break, we try to break it down into teams where there are about four engineers on a small work team, plus a product owner, plus a QA person, plus a data insights person, visual designer, user experience designer, and really anybody else that needs to be there marketing is dev to make that team successful. So that's pretty much an overview of how it breaks down. It's a great question. Do you have shared resources going across, like, on visual? Yeah, shared resources include uh, QA, we only have four full-time QA people. Um, because of all of our, we have like 40,000 automated tests and, and, and uh, growing. And let's see, user experience, uh, visual design are shared, biz dev is shared, marketing is shared. So, but we're staffing up, we're hiring by the way, we're hiring like crazy. Great question. Um, I'm just trying to be cognizant of the time. Patrick, help me out here, how are we doing? It's, it's almost nine. I want to do one more last question, and then... Um, okay, you choose the person. Who's going to go over, what did you say, it was bro crawl over broken glass? And then a burning question? Who has the best question? Don't get all shy all of a sudden. Since you've seen a lot of experiments, <coughs> how do you smell a bad hypothesis? Um, a bad hypothesis is vague, for one thing. Because somebody, like, here's the worst hypothesis. We're gonna, we're gonna build this thing because we're gonna learn something. It's like, yeah, yeah, probably we are gonna learn something, no matter what we build. But it's like, can we be a little more specific about what we're trying to learn? You know, like, so I think the more specific the hypothesis, the better. And um, God, we were just talking about this the other day, an example that I probably can't share with you, but um, yeah, it happens all the time, and we have to, we have to push ourselves. Uh, so that we don't get caught building something that later on we're like, wait a second, why does he just spend three weeks doing this again? Because that happens. Sure. So that's a great question. Yeah, we have this saying that <laughs> it has to do with getting rid of Vegas. So anyway, is that it? Great. Well, thank you very much, James.